My dad saw the movie, The Ten Commandments, and it completely changed his life, and he went into the ministry. We were going to a lot of different churches, and my dad ended up pastoring a church out in the country, in the, in the sticks, and, you know, literally, this church had an outhouse, you know? So, uh, as little, you know, little urban kids, that was a big deal, <laughs> you know? And so, my musical memories uh, included that experience. Then you hear the stomping on the footboard. You know, a call and response and that groove. Then next Sunday we'd be with his mom. My grandmother, Thelma, played organ at Metropolitan Baptist Church. Anthems and hymns from John Wesley and Bach and Mozart. And my grandmother was very white looking. She could have passed as white any day of the week. The next Sunday, I might be hanging out with my mother's mother. You're talking about serious, iconoclastic black church where my, my other grandmother was a gospel singer. I mean, she was a domestic. Um, she cleaned white folks' houses, you know, uh, five, six, six days a week, really and took care of their kids and the whole thing. But when it came time for Sunday morning, man, it was catharsis <laughs> with a capital C. And man, my grandmother sang, man, she could sing that gospel. Oh, the, the Lord, Lord, you know. Uh, the, the. You know, she was singing her, and man, she would, when she would get high and full of the spirit, man, she would take off and she would do a circuit around that church, pal. Yeah, so she got her aerobics in. You know, all those elements, those cultural elements, musical elements from Africa uh, and from the Deep South, all of the pop music, you know, just across the board, it all stemmed from that. You could just follow it, so easily follow it down to what I was experiencing here in Memphis and church. Growing up in Memphis, musically, it wasn't just, you know, blues and gospel and R&B. Man, we listened to a lot of rock and roll. 
My dad wasn't a big jazz fan, you know, neither was my mom. You know, they, he was listening to gospel, she was listening to Aretha Franklin. I was a kid, Grand Funk or Jimi Hendrix or the Jackson Five. That's what I wanted to play. You know, the band director says, welcome to high school. Would you like to be in the jazz band? And uh, the way he put it, you know, was just so, it's so nice. It was like I had, I had an option, you know? I said, no, sir, I really don't want to be in the jazz band. He said, well, let me put it like this. You are now in the jazz band. First day of rehearsal of the jazz band. And we played this song like called Straight Ahead and Strive for Tone. And it was completely different from anything I had ever listened to. There comes a moment when once you've played this part that is written, now you're called upon, each of you, to play what's inside of you. You invent something in the moment. You create it right there. And, and to me, that went, whoa. When I heard that music, I was smitten. It's interesting that my father as a pastor primarily, and then also as an executive in the postal system, you know, allowed me to pursue music. And, and I don't mean just, you know, going to trial for all city band. I mean, playing in a band called the Exotic Movement. Playing in little dive clubs, being a pickup band for some blues artist, you know, playing, you know, 100 miles from town in some dive club. The most conservative of the conservative is a black family. That, that's something that people really miss. I knew pretty much that the pastor who lived a block away would categorically not let his son or daughter be found dead in a, in a you know, juke joint. A black girl was not going to be going to the beach with a bikini on. No, you're going to have on a full body bathing suit. And that's just an example of, you know, how conservative black culture is at its core. All you have to do is go to Africa, where, you know, Americans may be you know, pretty liberal on a given thing, not Africans. I'm the fifth one of the six children. We used to go to school as no shoes on, you know what it is um, to go to school, no food, to go to sleep with no food. Each and every night we will sing and pray and go to sleep. That got us to understanding and believing and having faith in a very early age. I used to go with my mom. Um, I used to help her as a domestic worker, I would wash windows so that I can get clothes. There was a woman from Scotland, a missionary. So they started a church with my father uh, back at the village, my father and my mother. She took uh, my sister to create a school in Bloemfontein Music School. And me, I was worried and crying all the time at home because I was left by myself at the village. All my friends were gone but it was not very nice. The first song I started playing, it was, storm is over now. I can see the sun, summer beyond the clouds. I can feel heaven, heaven is over me. Come on and send me free. I didn't know anything. Why was I singing that song? I started writing. Uh, the song Loliwe. Loliwe is a dream. If you understand, for me, Loliwe means a journey. A train. I'm talking about that, uh, the old train, the choo choo train.
it goes not only to one place. It can take you from Germany to what what. But you gotta be patient. At the end of the day, you'll get to your store. I might be in the last carriage of a train. The one who's on the first carriage might get faster, but I'm gonna get to where I'm going at the end of the day. Music is telling a story. The tech and the fuka, the bond and the lane, the bona is really child. The tech and the fuka, the bond. Joburg. You must remember this village girl. I had only track suit and my t-shirt and my guitar, which had the case I made from my jeans and, and my skirt. So everyone was laughing at me. I remember Tata Mandela called me. It was when I just released Loli. I thought it was a prank. I'm like, oh, Tata, no, never. I've never seen Tata. I went there, I was shaking. I couldn't believe this. Asked for me to sing for him, and he asked me, Okoti Dungban, who am I? So I had to tell my story. So he asked for me to sing. And I remember when I, I finished um, playing, this is what he said I'm gonna try and impersonate him. You are a very special girl. South Africa is really blessed to have you. And may the stars shine upon your life and wherever you go. And then I was like, and I cried, I was trembling. And I decided I have to write a song about this man. All over the world, that's the, that's the song when they think of Tata Mandela, that's the song they play. I've got my own record label, which is called Emilage, the village girl. To think today, everyone that was laughing at me, uh, now I employ them. They're under me, now I pay them.
My dad lived racism every day. He didn't let on of the hurt that he felt because of racism. Like most black men in that particular era, you had to figure out how to process the hurt, which is real. But you had to play it in such a way where you retained your dignity. My father was very much a part of the civil rights movement, especially, of course, uh, in the early 60s when Martin King began to, to come here. And it was incumbent upon the local black clergy to basically organize and lead the movement in any given town. Who do you go to, you know? You go to the black clergy. I was nine years old when, when MLK uh, was gunned down about 14 blocks from my house. More so than that, the proximity of the authority figures in my life, right? The ones who were, you know, solid as a rock. You may see them shed a tear because they were happy at church, you know, but to see them grieving so just uh, profoundly in this moment, the kind of grief that's it's not just like and the loss of a family member. There's this other thing that, that is going on that has to do with, you know, the spiritual thing that has happened. You know, they're trying to catch their breath. They're like, my God, what is, what is going on? Just a, was a year or so before that, John Kennedy was killed. One by one, they're, they're taking down in whom we have not placed our hope here. So nine years old, I couldn't process any of that. He was saying, no, love is the answer. Love is the only weapon that we have that's really gonna work. And so now gun down, the guy who was saying that, that we have to do this non-violently, that part I, I got. And I couldn't sleep. I remember just dreading that the sun was like going behind that last little peak and now it's dark again and I know I'm not gonna be able to sleep because at night, man, I'm just, Oh my God, it was so traumatic because I couldn't, I couldn't process this thing that had happened. I remember, it's funny, there was a, uh, a, a meat packing company uh, called Morel Meats, a local company that had a, an ad on TV that went, Morel Meats, so good, Morel Meats, so good. So I would sing that song over and over and over again, that little ad, um, just to have something in my head like, that would keep me from, from thinking about this thing that happened. When I found out that it was at the Lorraine Motel, I mean, my dad would take us to the Lorraine Motel because it was a really nice pool. The public pools were pretty much segregated, right? And we would swim in that pool, and Miss Lorraine was obviously a friend of my dad's, and um, so I had memories of that place. You know, the balconies where he was shot would overlook the pool. Now, the National Civil Rights Museum is in that place, right? And the parking lot is, is over where the pool used to be. Martin King and all of his civil rights activists would always stay there, and they would strategize, and people would meet there. And the songwriters from Stax Records and High Records would also go to this hotel to hang out write songs, hang out by the pool. It was a place, by the way, where white folks and black folks could hang out together. Songs like Sitting on the Dock of the Bay were written at the Lorraine Motel. That moment in my life actually became axiomatic to my journey in ways that I never could have anticipated. And when I was like 50 years old, went through some counseling, and just trying to just get, you know, get a solid foundation, my wife and myself, and boy, guess what comes up? It was that moment when I was nine. I think the problem with the world right now is 
we don't listen to understand, we listen to reply. And when somebody has a different opinion, sometimes uh, we hate them. Different kind of race, we, we come from different kind of uh, religions. If you look at our, our differences, yes, there are some. But if you can look at our similarities, I'm pretty sure there's a lot. My dad is a musician, he's a jazz trombonist, and my mom was a singer. Probably around five or six years old. I fell in love with what they're working on. I mean, like, it's a different kind of job. <laughs> so I was like thinking, probably I should be a musician. I watched um, Chico Rea, electric band, with uh, John Petitucci playing bass, and I was like, wow, this guy. I mean, I never knew that a bass could sound like that. He play all the melodies, he play all the rhythms, he play all the chords. So I was like, this is crazy, this instrument. And then probably when I was around 11, I started to, to, to play the bass. When I started playing, then people would be like, dude, you play jazz. What you're playing is jazz. I try to play punk, I try to play rock, but then they'd be like, no, no. This, this kind of music requires a lot of virtuosity. But again, I, I always try to do my best. I always try to be excellent. I learn all the notes. When it's time for me to play, I kind of threw that away. I know I can do all these lines, but I don't want it to sound like I'm doing a line. I want it to sound like I'm doing um, music, like I'm, I'm singing through my bass. Um, it's how I express myself. If your level change. We talk about necessity is the mother of invention. Invention is improvisation. When somebody invents something, they're thinking, okay, this doesn't exist right now, but we need it. This music, which incorporates, man, you know, so many different strains, it couldn't exist without the crucible of oppression. And you could think of it as coming out of this necessity, coming out of the deprivation of a culture. You've got creative uh, genes, but you, what you don't have is access to higher education. You don't have access to the tools that one would need, you know, like really good instruments and stuff like that. Man, in black culture, and initially in African culture, we'll make it happen anyway. You know, you get somebody playing spoons, man. I'm telling you, some of the most amazing music I've ever heard has been made on spoons. For me, the whole process of improvising, playing jazz in that context, came from a terribly simple kernel. Grew up in a household where there wasn't much in terms of resources. I spent a lot of time sitting in a room listening to records, playing over records, trying to make a nice noise that sounded nice with the, whatever I was playing on top of. And my dad was a huge Bach enthusiast. Uh, my sister was a classical oboist, and my brother was a classical flautist. You know, as a teenage boy, I didn't want to be like them. I wanted to be different, I wanted to play different stuff. And rebellion turned into enthusiasm, and enthusiasm turns into love, and a slight obsession. <laughs> the force is working against you. The music that comes out is better. It's just qualitatively better than if things had been handed to you on a silver platter. What these Western musicians heard these black people doing, they were like, oh my God. And it's like, I want that music. The story of Dick Spiderbeck is a great uh, metaphor for that. You know, trumpet player, middle America, Midwest. He would have been playing classical stuff and whatever, but he heard Louis Armstrong, he's like, he left home. He's like, no, I, I want to. I'm going to where this person is, and I want to learn to play like that. Started playing trumpet when I was 12. Uh, I started playing gigs professionally when I was 17. 
I was playing with a funk band in London and we rehearsed in the same rehearsal studio as Sade. They one day needed a trumpet for a video. I was asked if I could do it. Then some gigs came for that. And so my first kind of real proper professional gig was at the Montreux Jazz Festival playing with Sade at, at like 18 years old. I played with some other English bands and then I went uh, to Berkeley in Boston. It was about six months into it and then I got another phone call from Sade saying, will you come to Paris and record a record with us? So I said goodbye to the college. And a peace comes over me The worries just fade away First, I tried to learn uh, jazz as Ella Fitzgerald, yeah, Nina Simone, yeah, Billie Holiday, and then I listened to uh, R&B, hip hop, uh, soul music. My father is Indonesian, Maluku Island, and my mother is from here. Dutch people came to Indonesia through Maluku, and I have two sisters, and I'm in the middle. I'm the different one. There's something inside me that <laughs> that pushes me. So I close my eyes and then I just go. There is something staring inside of me. I'm not sure what it is, but it's feeling feels like free and a taste of happiness. It keeps growing and growing. People are normally afraid of, of what's outside of their culture, right? They're, they're, they're suspicious of it. We as musicians get to say, man, let's mix this stuff up. Humanité is about identifying that beautiful thing that draws us together and that causes us to not be afraid. The fears, you know, which uh, triggers resentment towards other people who is not the same with, with your background or with your religion, your skin color, you know. I love singing since, since I was a kid. I think it's just a gift. I learned English through music. I listened to Whitney Houston when I was little. I love, I believe in you and me. Like that song is very meaningful for me because it get me through the darkest time. How powerful a melody and lyrics can be and can have an effect in someone's life because everything starts from within. Usually when I feel like I want to control everything, that's the part where I feel depressed and I feel stressed. And it's because like, I want to be perfect. We, we are just human, nobody is perfect. When I sing, I just think of God. On this day and age, people start to forget about that side and think that you know, what matters only is ourselves. Especially this time where the world is going through so much tragedies. I feel very sad every time I hear that people, you know, stereotype Muslims. Yes, we realize that we've always been different 
in terms of religions. We're used to hanging out even with not only the Muslims, not only the Christians, but even with Hindus, Buddhas, it's, it's never been a problem. When it comes to like hanging out or, or working or music or whatever, we're basically just Indonesian and we're trying to, to make our way, you know. What Martin King talked about the year or so before he was killed, he lifted off from civil rights, which had to do with people of color, the primarily black people. He lifted off into the, the stratosphere of the beloved community. He lifted off into the poor people's campaign. There are poor people of every color. There are more poor white people in this country by far than there are poor black people the beloved community, those who are marginalized, those who are otherized uh, globally. So life-giving and global, and also put him in the most vulnerable place a person can be. Now we're talking about the 99 and the 1. Now we're talking about the Vietnam War and any other of these wars that are serving corporations. You're standing between them and the thing they value most, and that is money. So now all of a sudden the MLK is dealing with some issues that make culpable some folks who don't want that to come to light. That's the thing about politics. There are people who are actually using the differences to put us apart. When it comes to election and everything, people will use that as a power, as a tool to, to actually defy people so they can get their vote or whatever, I don't know. And I think that's the worst thing that a human being can do. I am absolutely indebted to the jazz roots to have prepared me to make music with artists from completely different cultures, to begin by uh, empathy and appreciation for someone else's experience and what someone else brings to the table. So I have a son, Cameron, who's 23, uh, and he has cerebral palsy, born full-term, brain damaged. Diagnosis originally was very kind of general, vague. Uh, he has some kind of mild cerebral palsy, I seem to remember the doctor saying. And he has what's called tetraplegic cerebral palsy, so all three limbs apart from his left arm are involved. So, uh, and along with that, there's some significant learning difficulty and a autistic element. Now, having friends with children who have a more significant, more serious diagnosis, I can understand the use of the word mild, although at the time it didn't feel particularly mild to me. When he was born, I guess my life changed completely. Shortly after Cam's diagnosis, his mother and I split up. Uh, Cam stayed with me. Obviously, he doesn't walk. He's a, he's a full-time wheelchair user. So when he was a toddler, it was less impactful because you don't necessarily expect that toddler to walk. So I would turn up to studios, uh, to gigs, to sessions, with me and my laptop and my gear, and Cam. <laughs> Cam in a sling. I, on my, either on my back or on my front, little chair by my side whilst I am programming beats for pop records. So he knows all of my friends well, he knows Kirk well, they're all important people in his life. We live in a town called Hastings, which is a fishing town on the south coast of England, and has a very thriving musical community, which has an incredibly high standard. And so I get to make records with Leanne Carroll, who, in my view, 
and many other peoples is the greatest living jazz singer in the world. And I've lived in Hastings virtually all my life. I started playing piano quite early. My nan and mum sort of got me into it. But I used to love to sing along when I was practicing because I just love singing as well. It was a really noisy household. And I was encouraged to make a noise, which is lucky. There's so many other people in this town that create a kind of encouraging, vibrant community. And perhaps a good example of that is the fact that Leanne plays at this small wine bar in Hastings Old Town. This is a tiny bar, and she's played there since she was 16 years old. One day she'll be in New York playing at the Lincoln Center, and the next day she'll be at Porter's playing to people, all of whom she's known all of her life, with various guests sitting in. Everyone singing along in this multi-generational, really rare and unusual environment. She faced the hardest times you can imagine Many times her eyes fought back the tears about to fall in this time her slender shoulders by the weight of all her fears and a sorrow no one hears still rings in midnight silence in her ears let her cry Yeah, this song, I let out a lot of angst singing it because I suffered with depression for many years and I became an alcoholic. I've been recovering for over a year now. Well, any form of hope, let, let her cry. I mean, speaking as a woman and in this day and age with this little glimmers of Me Too and the sorrow, the silent sorrow only she could hear because it's true. What this song means to me personally, empowerment in women, is I grew up at a very early age witnessing my dad beating the living hell out of my mum. He was an alcoholic. Yeah, and I carried a lot of guilt because of the, one of the main awful worst times when we got an ambulance in was because I'd eaten his pudding. And I asked him if I could eat his pudding. And I went and told my mum that I was about six. I said, I can eat your pudding. Dad said I could eat. You know, anyway, he came in and said, where's my pudding? And he swung around the kitchen and bashed her head into the fridge. And I felt that was my fault. My mum was the softest, most gentle. For someone who was treated so badly, she had this strength in her of love. Be careful how you touch her, for she'll awake her and sleep. The only freedom that she knows. When you look into her eyes, you won't believe for the way she's always playing, for the debt she never owed, and a silent wind still blows. But only she can hear it, so she can't. The song I sort of, I do, I see young girls uh, that I've not met, but I can see them and I can feel their pain and I can feel. I don't know how many there are, but there are so many more than the heart can bear. 
and the song just spoke volumes. The more I did it each time, the more into it I got, but so it was almost harder, but then it was easier. And that isn't that just the sort of essence of music as well, you know. Oh, I remember we were saying free our girls. The young girls were taken to be whatever by those people. When you're an African woman, I am telling the truth, it's really difficult. I'm not talking about being slaved by your boss. I'm talking about being slaved in the house by even your husband, by even your brother, by even everyone. That's how hard it is. That young girl thinks that the world has ended, that because she was raped or raped. No, she's not alone. I am a woman. I am a daughter of this continent. I am a percussionist. I am a drum. I'm my father's daughter. I am a drum because I resonate. I percuss and I discuss. I'm noisy. And at the same time, I'm rhythm. I'm a whole lot of tones. I'm different shapes. <laughs> I'm different colors, and I dance to many songs. I wish my father could see me play. I started the piano when I was five. My mom is a traditional Japanese dancer, so she wanted me to do that, but I totally didn't show any interest. <laughs> and you know, piano is a Western instrument. I never thought about becoming a professional musician. But when I moved to Hiroshima, eight, nine, ten years old, I was crying every night. Oh, yeah. And that time I started playing piano when I was in tears. I started making melodies. So it's like a diary. This is like 31st year. Since I released my first album in 87, I was having a hard time. I was almost giving up. I was thinking about leaving this earth. I really have to support my mom and the two girls. My relationship with me and the piano became stronger and stronger. I'm fine when I hit the notes. When I toured in uh, Russia and Ukraine area, that was right after we had a tsunami and earthquake in Japan. After the show, a lady came to me. She was in tears and, and holding my hand. Thank you so much. And now we share our pain together. Being human is because someone created us this way. And so then we begin to explore our connections with each other. Just 
The thing I respect most about my dad is he was always reaching out to and rubbing shoulders with and sharing life with people uh, who had no agency. I remember distinctly my dad being in the kitchen at seven something in the morning at church, preparing to cook the bacon or he was gonna be doing the eggs or he was gonna do, he loved to do the biscuits. I mean, literally, you know, my dad could really cook. You know, he could bake biscuits from scratch. He wanted to be in the mix and a part of the lives of those people he was leading. But also just as a human being, living in solidarity and physical proximity to those who were marginalized. My fan said, your music brought us back to the roots of the soul. Okay, so this is my mission to make more harmony on this planet. I, you know, I have so small hand, barely reach to the octave. I cannot play so many tensions and so many harmony because I'm, I have a small hand. But I start knowing that even single tone, when I put my soul and heart, that's different. The music stays. So I want to write melody which can stay human's heart forever. I think I really found my voice as a saxophonist by listening to gospel singers. The passion and the expression and the just gut-wrenching soulfulness of this gospel singer. You know, you could say Aretha Franklin is kind of like the iconoclastic gospel singer, but who, you know, made her living doing pretty much other stuff. But what she does is as a gospel singer. And I, as a saxophone player, I wanted to sound like that. Way before I wanted to sound like Hank Crawford or I wanted to sound like Coltrane or, you know, Joe Henderson or my primary mentor, Arnett Cobb, I wanted to sound like a gospel singer. And so my voice through the instrument is the voice of a gospel. And so I'm able to contextualize that in bebop or in avant-garde or in funk or in whatever. So when I was living in LA, I mean, every other day I was in the studio with some big star, you know, Go West, everything but the girl from England. So pull those back just a little bit. Barbara Streisand, Quincy Jones, on and on. But what I was doing all the time was basically the voice of a gospel singer. I think that there was a particularly low low for Martin King when he sat there in that jail cell and came to grips with the fact that opposition to the beloved community it would come from the faith community. It would come from churches, it would come from pastors. When they told him, definitely not now, you know, we have to incrementally, you know, get this done. Martin King was careful to, to address that in his letter from Birmingham jail. If not now, when? I'm Elizabeth, Elizabeth Chiroya. I'm a mom to a little girl called Wanjiko, who will be five in May. But over the years, I've become a mom to quite a number of children as well in Karabosho. Um, they also keep me up at night as well, as I think about them and their issues. Music has always been a very good friend to me. 
When the priest who was running the parish at St. John's asked me to teach music to his kids, I thought it was the most natural thing to do. I wanted to share this passion of this, this amazing thing called music. Even those kids who have nothing else can have music. My name is Simon. I was born in a family of eight and raised up in Korogocho, Korogocho slums. Crime was very high, prostitution was very high, domestic violence. My older brothers got into crime at very early age. Korogosho is by the dump site. These families and children live off that dump site. The children, their parents have to go to scavenge for things. It's killing them, but yet it feeds them. The dump site is owned by gangs, and it has spread to the point where the dump site is right next door to us. They set it on fire, and that just creates this toxic, noxious smoke. My mother took me to St. John Catholic Church. That's where I met Elizabeth and Jeroge. So they asked us, do you want to play music? Ah, yes, we said yes, we want to play music. We used to hip hop and reggae music, that's what we grew up listening to. Then she's bringing in now classical music. Ah, and I felt, oh my God. I remember the first song was Hallelujah. La 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 la, la, la. no, it was very, <laughs> from hip hop, reggae, then la la la, la 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 la. It was very boring. But she came up with a technique of sustaining us, exposure. You ask yourself, I, so these people can come and listen to this kind of the music. So we started developing interest. Kirk said, how can I help? I said, you know, maybe if you wrote something for us and you, we recorded it with you. The beloved community, it, it, it comes at a cost. Forces are trying to make one better than the other, or forces that um, cause us to be afraid of each other as musicians and artists, filmmakers, uh, painters, you know, we have to be courageous and do it anyway and continue to show people, to show them that we're better together. The only weapon that we have that can, that can vanquish the things that separate us is love. I contacted some Ghetto Classics. If I can get some instruments, would it be okay for me to bring some instruments? Would that be cool? And they were fantastic and said, yes, we'd love some instruments, don't worry about it, please go ahead. So I put a post on Facebook to all my brass playing and woodwind playing friends and explaining the scenario. James came to me with a load of instruments that he picked up with the idea of taking them out to Africa. Started playing trumpet age 10. Parents thought I should be a professional trumpet player, but I didn't think I'd got it in me. And then, age 17, I went off to music college in Leeds, set up business when I was 19. Brought all the instruments in and he said, you know, just leave them with me and I'll have a look. I thought, great, that's so lovely, so generous. Went back a few days later, I said, so what do you think? And he said, oh, I've, I've repaired all of them. It, it's just one of those things that I live and breathe music. And if I can help someone else live and breathe the music, it just means so much to me. We arrive at uh, Nairobi in Customs and uh, I'm sent off to uh, be investigated. We're having these cardboard boxes. One of the customs officers says to me, so what's the value of these instruments? Is it uh, two, three, four, five thousand dollars? And I sort of smile at him and say, no, it's more like two hundred dollars really for the whole, all of them really. And the guy that gives me this look like, yeah, right. So luckily I had thought about this before. I packed one of the boxes with the oldest instruments at the top. So I open up the top of the box, get out this 
cornet in a wooden box, at which point he suddenly lost interest and said, oh, yeah, OK, well. Every evening for the entire week, we have been practicing for the Kak music. So after school, they shall meet from 5 to around 8 p.m. They don't care that he's a Grammy Award winning, blah, 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 blah. They don't. They don't know and they don't care. But he makes great music, you know, and, and they, they're like, wow, I want to be like that. The best thing about this music is that they, the kids learn to believe in themselves. The society can't influence them because they know themselves through sound, through instrument, through expression during performances, and they, they are confident. And that's the most important thing while a child is growing up. When you express through music, you feel relieved. It's like crying. Gito Classics is my family. We share the same instruments, the same pieces, the same conductor, the same tinkers. My dreams are finish my studies, teach the other pupils who are younger than me. After finishing my studies, um, go to a better university. We have changed the perception because of that music. It's part of us now, it's part of our culture, it's part of our society. The music have created the harmonious community. The beloved community. We can make beautiful art together. I gave a couple of lessons when I was there to young trumpet players. There was a couple of comments made in passing where, along the lines of, oh, well, lots of people come, but then they just go and we never see them again. When you go to play that C, remember to, to tongue it with a T sound. Ti a do ba, yeah? So I've started giving Skype lessons. So on a Saturday morning, I teach the young brass players of Corogocho over the internet. And that's going very well. I think what's been really interesting about the collateral beauty that one encounters from challenging situations. So I have a disabled son that has been challenging and beautiful and sad and terrifying and inspiring in equal measure. I got older and I went and married someone really quickly who, you know, who beat me up. 
who is an alcoholic. So I got out of that pretty quickly with a beautiful, stunning baby who is now 32 and has her own babies. And for the last 31 years, I've been with the man who I should have been with forever. But when I look at my daughter, I look at my granddaughters, that she's brought them up to believe in respect and love. And they're just so happy. I want everyone to be like that. <laughs> you do, don't you? There's nothing like that helplessness that one feels when you look at all these things that are going on, you're like, there is nothing I can do about this. These governments and these big corporations and these wealthy folks are running the show and they're running it into the ground. It's nothing I can do. But as a banker, as a teacher, and in this case, as a musician, as an artist, there is something I can do. There's something all of us can do. We can make beautiful art together. We can collaborate. We can empower and affirm and in ways that are insurgent, give life to and acknowledge the life of God in people from completely different cultures. Over the years of playing, I just wanted to work, be a better musician, enjoy singing, and I've always wanted to have a connection with the audience. Even if I get a bit shy or feeling a bit low and a bit scared to go on, I start playing. It's, it's, it's wonderful. Just within two or three bars, I'm, I'm there, I'm saved, I'm healed and cradled. People come out to be moved or they come out to have an experience, I think. And if, if we can share that together, that's, that's it. Jazz means freedom of expression, communication of love, communication of excitement, passion, the ability to do that without being restricted to reading what's in front of you. When you can love one another without actually thinking about any other background, any other religion, race or whatever, but it's, it's just love. The way God sees people is, it should be our way of seeing people as well. I want to inspire others, especially the young people, young kids, young musicians, because they don't have to uh, follow the what, follow the industry. You can stand on your feet, you can just just be brave and just be courage about uh, who you are. I can't live without music. Music is my energy, music is my passion, music is my life and, and hope. I hope that people that, that listen to my music will notice that there is still hope. That whatever you're doing, you think it's already done for you, you think you're done, you think you're finished, but I'm pretty sure, no. You still got a lot of things ahead of you, and that's what I want people to feel whenever they listen to my music, whenever they listen to my bass playing, that there is always hope, and there's always a way for you to finally be there. Just empathize with others. That simple act can make a great change to the world. Like music can heal. When I was young, when I was nine, I remember at church, people would force me to sing because they always say, when I sing, it heals them. I did not understand that until now. The thought that Mandela to get people together, it was through music. There had to be music, even to get people saying free Tata Mandela. The first concert was done in London. That was all about music. It got people together, speaking in one voice. You need music in your life. 
because it heals. Man, I, I have learned so much, and it has made me a better Christian, but it's made me a better human. It's made me a better global citizen. It's made me a better local citizen. I think sometimes people pit those two against each other. And you can't be a good American and claim that you're a global citizen. No, I think you can be both. I think you should. And maybe humanity is about being good neighbors. Peeking above, as it were, the hedges of our particular faith tradition, our cultural particulars, nationalistic, all of those other things, color, skin color, race, but peeping above that to say, hey, let's, let's come over and let's play in my yard for a while. <laughs>